the Buddha gives a list of five qualities that give strength to the mind. The list starts with conviction. And as the Buddha says frequently, the various members of the list, starting with conviction on through persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment, are developed through heedfulness. Now this may seem a strange combination. Conviction on the one hand implies trust, and heedfulness implies wariness. But if you really look carefully at what heedfulness means, it means that you believe that your actions do make a difference. Otherwise, there'd be no need to be heedful. In other words, if your actions did not make a difference, then it didn't, wouldn't matter how careful you were or how careless you were, how much you paid attention or how much you didn't pay attention. Everything would just happen in accordance with some outside force. So your basic trust is your trust in the power of action. And that through your actions you believe that you can see the difference between what would be careless behavior and what would be careful behavior. What is more likely to lead you to happiness and what's less likely. Now the problem is when you talk about your abilities and your desires, you realize there are many yous in there. It's not the case that you're the person who can trust yourself and everybody outside is somebody to be suspicious of. There are members of your inner committee that are trustworthy and other members that are not. Just as outside there are people who are trustworthy and people who are not. And you need to learn how to combine the inner trustworthy members with the outer trustworthy people to find a happiness that really does satisfy. Because a lot of what the world has to say is there is no satisfaction, or no genuine satisfaction. This ranges everywhere from popular culture even to modern philosophy. When they say that the self is divided, you can't even trust inside you who really is you and who is an outside force. In other words, all the influences that society has on you. When you come up with an idea, you can't really know for sure if that's your idea or just outside values speaking inside your mind. And the idea of sorting these things out, of finding a true way of finding true happiness, they're pretty skeptical about that. Now the Buddha cuts through all that by saying it is possible when the mind is trained, when you develop your powers of mindfulness and concentration and discernment, you can really start seeing which actions lead to suffering, which ones don't. Because there's one thing that's not really culturally conditioned, and that's your own perception of suffering. There is an ex extent to which you learn how to put up with certain kinds of suffering as inevitable. And that's culturally conditioned. And of course the mind has its ways of lying to itself about where pleasure lies and where it doesn't lie lying in both senses of the word, where it's located and also where it deceives you. But it is possible to train the mind so it really does get clear about these things. That's what trust, the trust of heedfulness is. The conviction in heedfulness, that you can develop the powers, you can learn how to act in such a way that you can trust yourself more and more, trust your ability to figure out what your actions are and what the results are, how they're connected, and which actions give better results than others. This is why we meditate, is so we can develop those powers. So it's not a matter of you versus the system outside, where the you is trustworthy and the system outside is not trustworthy. It's learning how to sort out inside you which perceptions, which thought constructs are actually more trustworthy than others. And you can test it if you get really clear on what you're doing and what the results of your actions are. 
those instructions that the Buddha gave to Rahula, even though he gave them to a seven-year-old child, underlie everything else the Buddha taught. This was part of the Buddha's genius. He knew how to boil things down to the real essentials when he was talking to children. And it's always important that we learn not to feel that we've gone beyond that point, that these are lessons that we always have to apply. And so what we're doing as we practice is making ourselves more trustworthy, learning how to sort out inside ourselves which ideas, which attitudes, which perceptions you really can rely on. So as we're developing mindfulness, as we're developing concentration, and developing discernment as we practice, we're doing this on the basis of heedfulness, because we realize that the more mindful you are, the more you'll be able to remember what you did, and then when the result of that action comes out, you'll be able to see the connection. And together with mindfulness, of course, goes alertness, so you notice exactly what you're doing. And when the results come, you really are clear about what's actually happening, what you're actually experiencing. The concentration helps you stay focused and not wander off. So you can really follow one thread of connections as they as the connections go through your life. You can see that yes, this really does connect up with that. Because as a John Lee once said, we can see results. We can also see causes, but if we don't make the connections between them, we don't really have any discernment. And it's a discernment that allows us to learn. So that we realize, okay, I did that and it led to this bad result, I don't want to repeat that. I did this and it led to a good result, I want to repeat that. And then you remember that. That's how mindfulness works together with discernment. It's a common phrase in the teachings of a lot of the Thai Chans, mindfulness and discernment. There's a term in Thai, satipanya, which means mindfulness, discernment. Really, it's used like intelligence but not just intelligence in the terms of book learning, but the intelligence that comes when you see connections and you learn how to remember them. You don't forget them. One of the stupidest things we do is we learn important lessons and then we just let them blur away. Don't really apply them, or we apply them in one area of life, but we neglect to apply them in everything. This is why the training is not just a matter of sitting here with your eyes closed, but it's the way you conduct your life all the time. As you develop these qualities, you find that heedfulness really does make a difference in your life, that the trust you put in your ability to choose your actions and to learn from your actions is well placed. Because that's the other part of heedfulness, is that we can learn. We have this ability to notice what we're doing and see the results that come out, the ability to see patterns. And then we can change our way based on our knowledge of those patterns. So heedfulness, even though it does imply a, an element of wariness, also requires trust. Trust in your ability to know what you're doing, trust in your ability to choose what you do, and trust in your ability to learn. So you can start sorting out all those different members of the committee inside, which ones really can be trusted and which ones can't. And sorting out your relationship with people outside, which people are good to hang around with and which ones are not. Which people can you trust and which ones can you not. The more you learn how to genuinely develop yourself as a trustworthy person, the more you're going to pick up on who outside is trustworthy as well. So it's a gradual process of focusing in, focusing in. Because in the beginning you may not be too sure, well, can I really trust this person, Can I really, or can I not? How about inside? Which voices inside can I trust and which ones can I not? 
So there's no absolute guarantee from the beginning. But as you really focus on this, and this is where the ardency and the persistence come into the practice as strengthening factors based on heedfulness, the clearer the focus becomes. And you really see that it is possible to satisfy your most important desire, which is the desire for a happiness that doesn't change. Almost every other account you read in modern psychology, whether desire is essentially sexual or whether it's caused by socialization or whatever the issue is, that the idea of having a totally true and satisfying attainment of what you desire is always viewed as an impossibility. But the Buddha said, no, it is possible to find a true happiness that is totally satisfying. And if you have conviction in that principle and you're heedful at the same time, you develop the strength of mind that's needed in order to reach that goal. So try to keep these points in mind. So you can sort out what you're doing as you're meditating and have a clear idea of what we're trying to do and where it's going to go, because that helps to answer a lot of questions right there.